Oh, whoa. Thank you. Appreciate it, y'all. Yeah, it's great to be here as always. Thanks for braving the weather. Uh, it's awesome. And then if you're watching online this morning with us, we're so glad that you are here. And we're just so thankful that we get the opportunity through technology to have everybody here. It's a pretty cool thing. And there's a lot of people working really hard to make that stream work every weekend. So it's pretty awesome that we get to do that. So but yeah, my name is Tanner Church and I'm one of the pastors here. And um, man, it's good to be with y'all. I've just felt all morning, I think this is a real sense of like God's presence here through worship. Um, and man, I'm just super excited to be here with y'all. A um, couple things to get into really quick, and then we'll jump into the message. Um, the first thing is that the 21 days of prayer and fasting just finished. So we just did that, which is awesome. So if you did that, way to go. Uh, 21 days, and I, I hope it's the same for you, but I was thinking about for me and my wife, we've been so um, thankful for and have loved the past 21 days. Um, the, the chance to, to get to give something up and just take more time than normal and more effort and more just purpose and intention behind some of the you know, prayer moments that we're having and reading scripture and, and fasting. And we just loved to get to talk about throughout the last 21 days what God's been doing and what he's been showing us. And I hope that that's the same for you. And um, if, if you have been not eating something or if you've been kind of doing, doing, the, doing the fast that way and today's your first day eating, be careful. Um, <laughs> It is Super Bowl Sunday, and so don't, don't get too crazy, you know, uh, with uh, what you eat. Otherwise, your belly's going to be a little upset. But also, um, you don't have to wait until next year to do something like this again. If this was a powerful season for you, um, I think it's great to build in regular seasons, regular time to fast, to give something up and spend more time in prayer, more time reading God's word. So, uh, but so grateful that we all got to do that together. And also we had the prayer hours. So 6.30 to 8.30 in the morning, we had just this space open and available um, to come to your quiet time, to come pray and just take some space um, here to come do that. And we do that every Thursday morning already from 6.30 to 8.30 on Thursday mornings. You can come in here and do that. So if that's something that you did and you liked, we do that. And that's something that maybe you want to try or want to get more into Thursday mornings. We have prayer hours. And the last thing I think is just go 49ers. I think that feels like the right thing to say. I don't. Whoa. Last week we talked about unity. So just remember, or two weeks ago, I guess, two weeks ago, unity. So I don't know. You know, go sports. Or as Josh, when his shirt is on, the overshirt just says or. I think that's funny too. So or. Anyway. Um, so today we are in Acts chapter four. So we're continuing in our series. And I think I put this together. This is Acts part one. Week five, chapter four. So it's really complicated, but that's where we're at. So um, last week, though, Pastor Ricky talked about um, chapter three, and then chapter four picks up like immediately after the events of what we read last week. So Peter and John, um, if you remember, they healed this guy who'd been crippled since birth. Um, and there's this incredible moment. Everybody's like, you know, freaking out about it, and they've seen what's happened, and um, there's just this huge, um, everybody's super interested and they want to know what's happening. And Peter steps into that moment and he did a couple things I think were really great that Ricky pointed out. The first thing that Peter did in that moment is he made sure that everybody knew that none of this was about him. He's like, I, I didn't do anything. This was Jesus. Immediately took that attention and said, you've got, you've, got, you've got to focus on the wrong person here. This is about Jesus. This is about what he did for this man. And then he said, um, he, he kept telling them, and Josh just referenced it, that he says, you are the one who killed the author of life. And he brings this perspective, this truth straight to them about, hey, we, we all share this responsibility for what happened to Jesus, but there's grace, but God loves you and God wants to save you. God wants to be with you. Just this incredible message of grace and truth. And everybody's freaking out. Like this is quite the wild scene that is just Happen. And so we're going to pick it up now in chapter four, um, what kind of happens after that big moment. So this is Acts chapter four, verses one through four. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed by what Peter and John were teaching the people, that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. So Peter and John are arrested. 
by this group, and there's a name for this kind of, all those groups of people that are referenced, it's called the Sanhedrin is the name for that. And sort of as I looked into it this week, that's kind of like just like the Jewish judicial system at the time. And um, the people that are kind of watching everything, making sure everybody's doing what they need to do. And so they hear about all this stuff happening, that um, so, so a miracles just happen. They're talking about Jesus. They come, and they're super unhappy with what's being said. And so they arrest Peter and John. But we also see at the end of that that there's 5,000 people now in total that have come to believe in Jesus. And I am guilty of this where I read, and I'm like, okay, I'm reading, reading, reading 5,000, next, next verse. But I really feel like this week, um, God was like, 5,000 people, like this has been a couple days and all of these people have been added. And I feel like a thing that I noticed and also how this message is kind of gonna be laid out for you is like, we're gonna walk through this chapter and I feel like I'm basically taking you through my quiet time. All these things that I noticed or things that God pointed out, like think about that, be challenged by that. And so we're gonna walk through a bunch of, a bunch of things and then there's a spot at the end that I really want us to land on. But I feel like one of the things that he just sort of was like, think about that, it was like there's 5,000 people that have been in the last few days added into the family of God and believed in Jesus. And all that they've heard, like think about how simple the message is. They're like, you killed the author of life, but he loves you and he's alive and so believe in him, to, to sort of paraphrase. And 5,000 people are like, absolutely. Like I will give up my life for that and I will follow Jesus because of that message. And I was thinking about, man, it's so simple and how much we, I think as modern church, sometimes we can be a little guilty of like really trying to dress it up. Like I wanna make it so attractive to you. I wanna make sure that I'm so creative, I'm so whatever about bringing the message, but there's something so powerful about the simplicity. This is what it is. This is who Jesus is. And he loves you and he came to die for you and so believe in him. So I'm not gonna dress anything up today. We're just going for it because I think it's the simplicity of the message of who Jesus, Jesus is, the simplicity of the gospel. So I was just challenged by that this week. 5,000 people added it with such a simple message because God is working and God's doing something incredible. So keep reading. Um, so they've been arrested. Now here we pick up in Acts 4, 7 through 9. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Question mark. And I love this, like, some of the sass of Peter again. He's like, oh, why are we here? What's going on? Because we did a good thing, you know? He's got a little bit of that, but, and I think that's funny. You know, you see Peter's kind of personality coming out there. But I think what's, what I want to focus on in this little section here is that it says Peter filled with the Holy Spirit stood up and stepped into this moment. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. There's something about this moment that I feel like the Spirit went like, hey, this is a moment and step into it. And I think it wants us to see that, that he stood up, filled with the presence of God and stepped into this moment. And last week, it kind of used a similar phrase where it basically said, Peter sort of recognizing that everybody was looking, everybody was watching, everybody was listening. He stepped in and he gave the sermon that we read last week. There's something about Peter in these moments where I think the Holy Spirit is prompting him. And I think the way that I've heard this talked about is like that Holy Spirit nudge. This is that moment where it's like, hey, step into this. This is an important moment. You're going about your day. Things are happening. It's normal. But all of a sudden, there's, there's something, this little nudge, this push from God, like this is a moment. Amen. And step into it. And I want you to say something. And I'm with you. You're filled with my Holy Spirit, and I'm going to use you in this moment. I think Peter stands up again right here and recognizes God wants to use me in this moment. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking about for myself, when have I felt those nudges? When have I had those moments? Am I receptive to those moments? Am I listening? That's the challenge for me and for us. So we can step into those moments just like Peter is about to. So here we're going into what Peter says now. So he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He stands up. This is what he says in Acts 4, 10 through 12. Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Amen. Super great moment. 
this powerful moment where Peter steps in and just it repeats exactly what he just said last week. He, he, he's, he's walking that same exact line. He's bringing truth straight to them. He's like, you did this. Or, or first off, he says, this is all about Jesus, right? Yeah, like Jesus is the one that healed this man. This is all through the power of Jesus. And then he brings that truth to them again about the responsibility that we bear in this, but that Jesus is alive, that Jesus has raised from the dead. And then he brings this, this Old Testament Scripture about this, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The idea there being that the most important foundational piece that you construct upon is that cornerstone. And you rejected that stone. But he is the foundational element to build your life upon. Amen. That's who Jesus is. He is the cornerstone. Everything about who we are, everything about our lives is built on the foundation of who Jesus is. And then such a great line in verse 12. And one of the foundational beliefs for who we are and what we believe as a church, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Such an important and beautiful moment from Peter. There's nothing else. There is no one else. Nobody has that authority and nothing has that authority. The only way that we are saved is through Jesus, is by Jesus. And again, I read through things sometimes really quick because I feel like I've heard it, I've read it before, but God like paused me here this week. And I feel like the challenge that I have in this section of the scripture is that I feel like I know that, that, that there's no other name by which I can be saved and it's all Jesus. That's, a, that's knowledge, but do, does my life match that all the time? Does, does the way that I live prove that that's what I believe? Because I think I'm really guilty of, and I think a lot of us are of, I'm the cornerstone, actually. If, if we're looking at how I live my life, I'm building it on me. I'm building it on my effort. I'm the one who's trying to save me. I'm the one who's trying to put it all together. I'm the one who's trying to walk this out and figure things out. It's me, if I'm being honest, but he's the cornerstone. Amen. It's about building on him. There is no one else. Does my life match what I know? Does my life match what I say? And I want to be challenged by that. I want to walk that out. What does it mean to really believe and walk out? There's no other name and there's no other thing that can save me. It's only Jesus. So now we'll read the reaction of the Sanhedrin to all of this. And I love, I just think this is so funny for whatever reason, but uh, Acts 4 verse 16, uh, they say, what should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. This is a great moment. And I think, again, a, a cool challenge for all of us if we're willing to accept it. They kind of gather together and they're like, what, what do we do? <laughs> like, there's nothing we can do. And I think that's really challenging. For me, they're, they're looking at Peter and they're like, and it's, it's kind of what I just said. They're like, what he just said, what he's saying is exactly what he did. Like, there's no holes that I can poke in that. Because there's the guy that we've all known has been crippled since birth and he's leaping. Like what Jesus says about, or what Peter says about who Jesus is and what he can do, there's the evidence, there's the proof. So they say, what do we say? And I think a great word to sum that up is there's integrity. What, what Peter says is what happened. Do I have that integrity? When somebody looks at me like the Sanhedrin are with Peter and they're looking at him under a microscope, trying to get him in trouble, trying to figure out where it doesn't match and they go, what do we do? Because there's nothing that we can say. Is that true of me? Is the way that I'm living, does it so match what I've said? What I talk about Jesus, how I preach about him, how we talk at life group, is that what I look like every other day? Or if somebody looked at it, could they poke holes in it? And they could say, no, that doesn't match up. Because Peter, he matches up in this moment, and I want that challenge. They say, what do we do? How can we refute what has happened? I think there's a lesson there for us about integrity. We want to be people that walk it out, just like Peter is. So they continue here. This is verse uh, 21 through 22. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. So there's this moment where I kind of feel like they're like, all right, you guys go on now. And don't say it again. 
you hear, you know? They're like, okay, you've been warned. You know, like, they're just like, but bye. You know, I just think it's so funny. There's like, there's nothing they can do. What are you going to do? And I, I'm challenged by that. I want that to be true of me. And so I, I think it's so cool. I've kind of, we've read sort of the first half of this chapter now. And I think sometimes I, just see, I see the power of reading God's word in this example that we've kind of shared here. Because I think like this is just sort of like recounting the events. This is what Peter said. This is what they said. And sometimes we just read through it. But I think if, we, if we're willing and if we step into our time when we just sit down and we read scripture, there's so much that I think God highlights. And I feel like this week I, I, I had it where God was like, think about that. Like, don't just read over it, but like, is that true of you? Or how, how does that challenge you? What do you think about this? And I'm reminded that the Bible is living and active and it speaks. Amen. Even in just a simple, this is what they said sort of story, there's challenges because the Holy Spirit is talking to us yes. and he's speaking and he's challenging and he's asking us things. I just think the Bible is so cool like that. And so my challenge for us again is like, when we're sitting down to read our scriptures, think about these things. Like ask, okay, what, what are you saying to me here? What's the challenge? What's something that I need to be hit with? What's a way that I need to walk different? There's so many cool things I think that happen in even just that little chunk of scripture. And so this last section now, chapter four, is where I really wanna take some time. I think there's something really powerful for us um, and something really challenging for us in the next little chunk of scripture. And uh, your Bible might have like a, like a subject line now for this next section, and it probably says something like, the believers pray for boldness or they pray for courage. That's probably what it says. And so we're gonna read now this, uh, this whole prayer that they pray. So it's a larger chunk, but it's just so good. So let's read this. This is Acts 4, 23 through 30. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all of the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. Here are for Herod Antipas, I don't know, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, um, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with your healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Amen. Awesome moment. And I love that prayer. They're gathered together. Peter and John get back. They say, hey, this is what's just happened. And they gather and they pray together that prayer of boldness. And I love that prayer. And I'm reading that prayer. And then on Friday night, as I'm like polishing this message together, I like very strongly um, like more than normal for me, felt like God asked me, like, what would you have prayed right there in that moment? Uh, like, what, what would you have done? Like, use your imagination for what this moment is. Peter and John get back from being arrested, spending the night in jail, getting questioned, and they go back and tell everybody, hey, this is what just happened. And I'm guessing here, but I imagine that there's probably a sense in that group of like, this is probably gonna keep happening. Like, this isn't going to get better, and so there's going to be more of this probably, and more maybe people getting arrested, more danger, more persecution, more opposition. And I feel like God came right into, into my little moment, and he was like, what would you have prayed? And then I feel like God was like supernaturally like showed me my prayers in difficult seasons that I've had, where like I knew it was about to be a tough time. And I knew I was about to go through transition or I knew there was relational conflict and I was stressed about it or I knew somebody was sick or, or something, whatever the difficult season was. And I feel like I could hear my prayers in my head, which were all, God, I pray for a quick and easy transition. God, I pray that this season that's in front of me, God, I pray you'd make it easy. God, would you help me to get through it quickly? God, would you take all the obstacles away? God, would you make a path? And I pray for people, like, God, I pray for a, a, a quick and easy recovery. I feel like God just showed me all of my, God, I pray for, I pray for this would go easy. 
God, I pray that this would be so simple. God, that this would get over so quickly. That's what I pray in those moments. And I feel like God showed me that. He's like, you pray for easy and quick. And he goes, what did they pray for? Boldness. Nobody in that room said, hey, let's pray that this doesn't happen anymore. Like, hey, let's all gather together in a prayer meeting and let's pray that all those voices are silenced. And let's pray that our time sharing the gospel gets easier. And let's pray that it's effective and it's simple and we can get the word out quickly to everybody who needs it. Like, that's what, like, let's pray for that. None of them pray for that. They don't ask for the situation to change. They don't ask for any of that. They say, God, would you make us bold to get out there and actually share the message and to perform signs and wonders? Like, I'm not asking you to change anything about what they're doing, but would you give me boldness? And I wrote this down. Instead of changing my situation so it's better for me, God, would you change me so I can be better in this situation? I feel like I get so trapped in like, okay, God, would you just work this out? Would you make this easier? Would you make this quick? And I'm challenged by what God does with this prayer. So they pray this prayer for boldness. And then let's look at what happens in verse 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached the word of God with boldness. The place they're in is shaking and God pours himself out again on them because they prayed for boldness. God fills them with the Holy Spirit. I feel like you can almost see God in that moment. Like you prayed for boldness. And so I'm compelled to just pour myself out on that. Like you're not praying for easy. You're not praying that this all just works out somehow, but you're asking that I fill you, that I give you boldness and courage. So I will pour myself out for that. You don't want easy. You want boldness. So they're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is cool because wait, they're already filled with the Holy Spirit. Like we just read that a few weeks ago where the spirit comes and there's the tongues of fire. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. All these people were there. They're already filled. But here's this moment where God's like, but there's more. And if you want it, I will give more. If you're praying for boldness, I will pour myself out for that. You are filled, but I will fill you again. There's more that you can have of me. So a couple like theological points here. We see the, the idea of multiple fillings of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see more of these throughout Acts. That this isn't like a one-time thing where you get the Holy Spirit and now that's it and you walk the rest of your Christian life out. You maybe can live that way, but why would you want to? If there's more, let's want more. Like God can give you more, fill you more. So we see this idea, there's multiple fillings. So everybody in here, I think if, if you've given your life to Jesus, you've surrendered to him, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about that he is a seal. He's like a down payment. This is my promise that, that I'm with you. This is my promise about what's gonna happen in the future, that I'm sending you my Holy Spirit. You're filled with the Spirit, but you can be filled again. You can be filled more. So do we want more? That's my question for us. Do you want it? Like, do you want more? Do you want God to pour out more of himself on you? And I feel like we, if you're honest too, I think you've probably had moments like this. I'm willing to bet, because I was thinking about it, you know, okay, what are the moments I feel like God has stepped in and filled me, given me extra? And I remember there was a time when I was in college and we were in this prayer meeting and we were sort of being asked or prompted to pray for people in our life that weren't saved, like people that we knew that were like, gosh, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to believe. I want them to, to turn and I want them to follow him. And I was praying for this person in my life that I love that just wasn't following Jesus. And I'm praying and I'm praying. And then all of a sudden, like something shifted in that moment. And I was praying like I've never prayed before. And I was desperate and I wanted it. And I was asking God. And I feel like God in that moment was like, well, I'm pouring myself out then. And I'm gonna fill you for this moment. And I'm gonna give you the words and I'm gonna encourage you and I'm gonna push you in this prayer. And I felt that moment. Have you ever had those moments? I've talked with so many people. I talked with another person right after first service that told me their story about, I was, she was working in the hospital and there was this guy that came in and needed something. He was looking for his wife who'd been admitted like earlier that day or something. And she talked about that normally this is what she would have done. She would have told them where to go and whatever. But she was like, in that moment, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I knew it. And I walked that man through the entire thing and I helped him. And I, it, it was just an incredible story. And she started to tear up. She was like, God, 
filled me for that moment. Like I, all of a sudden, I knew this was a moment that God was doing something. I'm filled, and so I walked it out in a different way than I would have. And I hear so many of those stories. And there's um, like so many moments in my life as a pastor over the last however many years where I've been walking into situations that I am 100% unqualified for. Like, I, like I'm like, what on earth am I going to say or do in this situation? I have no clue what to do. And there was a moment, so I worked at a church in North Carolina, or I was, I was told in the last service, the great state of North Carolina. Um, it is great. We loved it. But I was working at a church there, and there was a situation where there was this um, family in our church, and um, their son, who was like, he was like eight or nine years old, was like deathly ill. And he's five. There we go. He's five years old, even younger. And so sick, and this horrible series of events had happened that just quickly, um, out of nowhere, he was sick. Um, and I remember walking into the hospital after they were told, like, your son will not make it through the night. Just, that's the reality. And so we recommend, like, let's, you know, basically pull him off whatever life support he's on because there's nothing we can do. And I remember walking into that room on this side of the door going, I have no idea what I'm going to say. I have no idea what to do. Or I'm going to talk to this dad who's in this situation right now. And when I stepped on the other side of that door, I was confident. Hallelujah. And I knew Amen. God's filled me for this moment. And whatever I'm about to say, I don't even know what I'm about to say, but I'm stepping into a moment where I know God is filling me to do something. And I knew I was unqualified for it. And I'm sure you've had moments, you're like, I don't know what to do here. You're right, you don't. But be desperate for God. Want more, he'll fill you. And God, in that moment, he, I walked into that room and I knew God's with me. He's filled me for this exact thing. And part two of that story is the boy miraculously recovered and is alive and is great. And he's, yeah, the, the doctors called him the miracle boy. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Do you want more? Do you want to be filled? Is that what you want? Do you want more of them? So as we close, I've got three things that I think are important from this passage, three things to work on, three things to do, I think, from this, this idea. Number one, if we want to be, I think, bold people filled with the Holy Spirit, we need to cultivate our relationship with the Holy Spirit. I need to cultivate that relationship. I need to grow in it. I need to get closer to him. Peter stands up filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm challenged because I think Peter has this relationship with the Holy Spirit that he knows this is a moment. I've spent enough time, I've, I've walked in relationship with him, and so I recognize what he's doing in me right now. He stands up because he recognizes the moment that he's in the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We need to spend time with him. I remember um, growing up in church and sort of the churches that I was kind of growing up around or in pretty much into my like, uh, like probably college age, sort of the joke that was around for a lot of my friends and I was like, it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. Like the Spirit just got forgotten somewhere. We were, they were like, well, he does something, something. We don't know what he does, you know? There was just like, nobody talked about him. Nobody said anything. Nobody talked about who he was or what he did. And then I remember in the season of my life where he was introduced to me in a whole new way. And I was like, oh, he's with me every single day. He's the one who's with me and in me and empowering me and encouraging me. He's the one I get to talk to. He's the one I get to build relationship with. It changed everything for me. And I remember thinking, like, I have not done anything with this relationship up to now, but now I need to cultivate it. I need to spend time and build that relationship. There's a lot of verses that I could have or wanted to throw in here, but John chapter 16, 5 through 8, this is Jesus talking. It says, but now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, which is the Holy Spirit, won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he, uh, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and the coming judgment. Amen. Really cool moment where Jesus is saying, and have you ever thought about how crazy this is? That Jesus says, it's better for you if I go. 
And I, I, I feel like in Christian circles, this happens a lot. We're out on the, you're at like a party or something, icebreaker questions, and they're like, what's one historical figure that you'd want to get coffee with? And we all feel like we have to go, well, Jesus would be the first one. Then we go, okay, well, other than Jesus, right? Like, oh, yeah, I, want, I would want to, like, get coffee with Jesus. And I feel like Jesus here is going, no, you, no. Like, you have the Holy Spirit. It's better that I leave because Jesus can be in one place at one time. He's with his 12 people. The Holy Spirit can be in all places at all times with everyone, leading them and convicting them and encouraging them. Jesus says, it's better if I leave because then he comes and I will send him. And he's your advocate. He's your helper. He's your comforter. He's going to walk with you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to convict you. He's going to lead you. And how crazy is it that I ignore him if that's the case? Jesus says, it's better if I leave because then this is what you get and then, I, and then I don't even spend any time with him Amen. or talk to him or think about him when he's the one who's actually doing the work in my life. We need to spend time with him. The only way to build a relationship with any person in your life is to spend time with them. No relationship in your life gets better when you don't spend time. Not a single one. And this is the same way. So spend time, talk to him. Ask him things. Ask him to speak to you. Spend 10 minutes in quiet and think about him. Spend time with the Holy Spirit. We need to cultivate our relationship. Don't ignore him. Spend time with him. So yeah, number one, cultivate your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number two, want more. Like let's, let's just be, let's be bold. Let's be straight up about it. Let's want more. I don't want to be satisfied at all with the amount of God that I have right now. I want more. I want to be filled again. I want more of his presence. I want more of his love. I want more of his grace. I want more God in my life. We should want more because there is more. Now, thinking about this, my first example here is because I'm a nerd and I love, so the Lord of the Rings, maybe greatest thing (laughs) other than the Bible. I don't know. But um, the Lord of the Rings, incredible movies, incredible books. I was practically raised on the Lord of the Rings, like reading them, and watching those movies constantly, like I loved it. And, and, but for a long time, that's all I did was just those three books or those three movies, The Lord of the Rings, that was it. And then in the last probably, like honestly, five years or so, I've kind of like realized how many other books J.R.R. Tolkien wrote and how much more there was. And so I started reading all these other books. Now it's like The Lord of the Rings is the tiniest sliver of story in like thousands of years of story about this world and these characters. And it was so awesome. I was like, man, there's so much more. And I had no idea. But once I wanted more, and once I realized, I was like, okay, I'm gonna read all of these. And there's still so many books I haven't read. There's so much, but there's so much in that world. Do you want more? Because there is so much more. My other story is that, so my daughter, Beck, who's just, man, we, there should be a whole sermon series on Beck. It would be, it'd be a wild ride. But she does this thing, and she's done it for quite a while, like on her birthdays or on, like on Christmas, where there's like, there's like 15 presents under that tree that all say Beck. And she opens one, and she's like, well, good, I'll see you later. And she just like, that's all she plays with. And Sarah and I are like, but, the, but the, you know, like, look, there's so many more. Like, don't you want to open? And she's like, yeah. And so Christmas, like everybody's done opening presents, but there's like six more presents. And we keep having to like bring Beck in for hours to be like, open this one. And then she'll open that one and be like, I'll play with this now for a few days. And like, it just took, it was on and on. And we kept saying like, Beck, there's so much more. But like she opened the one thing and was happy with that. Don't open the one and just be okay. There's more for you. Do you want more? We need to want more because there is so much more. This is Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 
like Paul's on a roll with that one. There's so much in there that you'd be strengthened through his power in your inner being, through his spirit in your inner being, that we could comprehend, that we could learn more about his love for us and we could be filled with all the fullness of God. And then also, now to him who's able to do more than you could ask or imagine, abundantly more. How much more do you want? How much more are you going to ask for? How much more can you imagine? Because he can always do more than that. I think that's what's challenging me with that verse is whatever my ask and imagine is, he can do more. And no matter where I raise my ask and imagine to, he can do more. Do you want more? We need to want more of God because there's so much. And I feel like he's sitting there waiting, wanting that boldness. When you pray, instead of easy, when you pray for bold, I will fill you and I will give you more. So ask and imagine. And I think we will see what God does with that prayer. Number three, the last thing is to change our prayers. I think we need to change our prayers a little bit. And this is what I was challenged with so much this week. I think, like like I said, God showed me, he's like, this is all the times that you pray for this exact thing. Easy, simple, quick. It's like, change your prayers. Pray for boldness. Pray for courage. Pray that I would fill you, like fill you up. Pray for that. I want to read this verse again from Acts chapter 4. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Give us boldness, great boldness. I think we need to change our prayers. And I'm sure in a room like this with everybody here and everybody watching online, there are so many situations that you are walking into or are in the middle of that are difficult, that are challenging, that are stretching you. And I'm gonna ask a scary, dangerous thing of us. Because let's be honest, that sounds scary to stop praying for easy and simple. But God, I, like, I do want it to work out. And I do want this to be over quickly. And I do wanna get through this. I think there's a beautiful truth about who God is that he does bring reprieve and he does bring rest. God's a good God and he brings good things for us. But I think there's a challenge to say, but what are you gonna pray for in this? Pray for boldness. And I think the thing that I wrote down for myself this week is I think God was saying to me, I don't need to fill you for easy. You don't need me for that. So if if you want more of me, pray for boldness. Don't pray for easy. Don't pray for simple. Don't pray for quick. Bold prayers. God, fill me. I want to be used by you. I want to do something powerful. I want to walk in obedience. God, don't just change my situation. Change me. Make me bold. The Holy Spirit does not need to fill you for easy. So let's pray bold prayers. So I'm going to ask us to stand right now, and we're going to pray for boldness if you want to do that. I think we're gonna pray that God would fill us. We're gonna pray that God would use us. So I'm gonna ask everybody, I think a, a great posture to take right now is just with your hands out like this. This is how you receive. When anybody's given you something, you put your hands out and you receive it. And, I, and we're asking God to give us boldness. And so if you're comfortable, put your hands out like this and let's pray. God, we are asking you right now for boldness. God, we're asking you for courage. God, we're asking you in Jesus' name to fill us with more of yourself. Holy Spirit, fill us again right now. God, give us the boldness and the courage, God, to step out and to follow you and to be examples, God, of who you are in our life. God, help us to be people that what we say and what we do line up. Help us to be people that walk in that integrity, God. Give us the capability, God. Give us the drive and the passion to follow you in that way. And God, every situation that we walk into, God, starting today and throughout the next weeks and months and years, God, give us boldness. God, right now, we're not gonna ask that you make things simple or easy or quick, but God, would you give us boldness to face whatever it is and to walk it out and to seek you through it all. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us boldness, give us courage, give us strength, God. 
Help us to recognize the moments that you're pushing us, those Holy Spirit nudges, those moments that you're filling us. God, help us to recognize it and walk with authority in those moments the way Peter did. To recognize the moments that we're in, God, and to speak up and to say and to be bold. We do not wanna sit on the sidelines. We do not wanna watch as all this happens. God, put us in. Give us boldness, give us strength, give us courage, and give us more of yourself. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.